Dobar dan. Dobar dan vsem. Welcome to Friday day of uh, Indigo. A long expected day. Today we have, we have here two prominent guests. Peter Sloterdijk, German philosopher. Philosopher and cultural theorist, he's a professor of philosophy and media theory at the University of Art and Design, Karlsruhe. He got many German international awards for his work. He wrote a conic book, Kritik der Zynischen Vernunft, published by Surkamp in 1983, Critic of Cynical Reason. In 2002, Sloterdijk began to co-host in Glachhaus, the Philosophische Quartet, in the Glasshaus, the Philosophical Quartet, a show on the G German ZDF television channel devoted to discussing key contemporary issues in depth. Peter Sloterdijk wrote numerous books where he finds unexpected and unsought connections which we don't see or don't want to see. If Peter Sloterdijk did not exist, we, we would have to invent it. <laughs> Slava Žižek, I hope we, I cannot, I, I will not present because he's really from Ljubljana, very well known theorist, theorist professor, lecturer, and our, as I might say, treasure. Uh, he's regular guest of uh, Indigo Festival, and um, he is here with his guest almost now for four years. Um, I would like to thank and to um, say hello also Steirische Herbst. Uh, a lot of people from Graz arrived today for this lecture. And of course, I would like to say thanks to Goethe Institute and especially Director Alice Landgrebe, who will take over about uh, discussion about these two uh, important persons. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. There is a law in Sweden, as soon as two men appear on stage, there have to be two women as well. Probably this law will be soon introduced to all of Europe, and that's why today I'm here to train, although I'm only one. <laughs> um, there's not enough time today to discuss all the topics we could, would, but we will all learn tonight, I trust, what it means to be wanting to die for the truth. Let me say a few words about Peter Sloterdijk and Slavoj Žižek. They're both from different philosophical schools and they see the world very differently, but they also have a lot in common. Sloterdijk was called the most cheerful philosoph philosopher of Germany. And cheerful, like. Cheerful, yes. And <laughs> you, the <Aware>. funniest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are both world famous. They're both professors. They have fan clubs. And they both wrote bestsellers. And of course, they're both controversials. And they have a lot to say to each other. Peter Sloterdijk, as Blage has already mentioned, has written the critique of cynical reason. And the title was, you can say, A Stroke of Genius. It made him famous immediately. And this was the first philosophical bestseller after Second World War in Germany. Let me hand over the word to Peter Sloterdijk. A warm welcome. Um, and we are going to start with Nietzsche. Shall I begin? OK. Thank you. So we, we agreed. Uh, to propose our personal concepts of what we think that philosophy means. Let me uh, begin with an anecdote uh, told by Rousseau, uh, who in his uh, founding essays about modern politics quoted an ancient author 
who reported the story of a, uh, a woman, a mother from Sparta, uh, who, after having received the message, that five sons had died in battle, fell down on her knees and thanked the gods for becoming such an important mother of, her of heroes. And the strange thing is that Rousseau was very fond of this anecdote because he's, his own uh, concepts of modern society uh, inclined into the direction of, an, of a neo-spartanic homogeneous society as it were in a, in a kind uh, of uh, social uh, mass in, in which quasi-Islamic -isla forms of coherence exist. Uh, he wanted to suppress the subversive qualities that the Christianity had introduced in, in Western politics and the split between co conscious and, and, and political reason uh, was for, for him so, sc so scandalous. But he introduced at the same time, uh, you could draw back one of the origins of what we later called fascist tendencies in modern thought. Of course, you could draw that back to, uh, to, to Rousseau. But at the same time, there is an element of extremely uh, progressive and unheard of uh, point, point of view. In, in, uh, you find in his introduction to his famous Discours sur l'origine de, 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 de l'inégalité, where he declares, I would have preferred to be born into a small community yeah, where, which is so remote that the greed of a conqueror uh, would not be triggered by this little state and which is uh, weak enough not to lead uh, wars of aggression. And in this small society, uh, I would have lived and died under the rule of laws that nobody uh, would deny and would never, uh, it would never come to, my, to mind uh, to resist to these reasonable forms of, of order. And the, the sensational aspect uh, of this argument is <clears throat> that he assumes a point of view that is authentically philosophical, which uh, is to say that he assumes uh, the impossible position of a prenatal choice of, ex of his own existence. Uh, so uh, philosophy is something that unroots the thinking from, from existence. Uh, and you can uh, find this gesture at the beginning and at the end of the philo history of philosophy. In the beginning, with Plato, I shall uh, say a couple of, of words uh, about his new concept of truth. And in the end, with this uh, progressive uh, Rousseau, and later on with, with Heidegger, who uh, invented the, co the concept of Gebürtigkeit, which is taken up by Hannah Arendt uh, and under the concept of nat natality. So it's no longer mortality, the focus of philosophizing, but natality. And if you can <coughs> adopt this, this impossible uh, position of, of someone uh, who puts his real existence in brackets and says, uh, I reject my real life, but, but to tell you the truth, I would have preferred to be born in another world, in another society. Then for the first time, you really assume a, a philosophical attitude that is as strong as Plato's invention of, of truth, uh, which has a double face.
Now, let me read a, ch a short chapter of the pa famous paragraph 344 from the Gay Science, uh, under the title, To What Extent Even We Are Still Pious? It is said with good reason that convictions have no civic rights in the domain of science. It is only when a conviction voluntarily condescends to the modesty of an hypothesis, a preliminary standpoint for experiment, or a regulative fiction, that it has access to the realm of knowledge and a certain value therein can be conceded. In another context, Nietzsche says, truth has no stronger and more venomous enemies than conviction. Uh, convictions are more dangerous to truth than lies. But Plato goes on uh, when he says, uh, well, what is the deeper reason why we think that truth is so important. And he, uh, his answer will be, truth is important because we do not want to be deceived. And we do not want to be deceived, not even by ourselves. So we, uh, we are, as it were, condemned to an attitude of absolute honesty an honesty that goes beyond the limits of uh, the life interest. Uh, and therefore, Plato can say, I will be understood, namely, that it is always a metaphysical belief on which our belief in science rests, and that even the we, knowing ones of today, the godless, and anti-metaphysical. We still take our fire from the conflagration kindled by a belief of a millennium old, the Christian belief, which was also the belief of Plato, that God is truth and that truth is divine. Sorry, Jacques. And, it, like is, uh, and it is absolutely clear that, the, uh, the that, that, that Nietzsche cannot uh, stop here, but he has to, to add one more question, that what about if this belief, this conviction has become un, uh, untrustworthy in, in our old days? Uh, what happens if we uh, are abandoned by truth and we are no longer in the position uh, of someone uh, who renounces completely to our faculty of self-deception. This is certainly a point where the uh, synatalytical uh, point of view uh, of, of Slava will uh, interfere. But we find something very important. Uh, Plato introduces here only one concept of, of truth that means the absolute sincerity. But what he does not say here, but uh, Nietzsche is well aware of that, that uh, truth is something that has one strong presupposition, that truth is more important than life, and that Socrates will die for the, for the truth, and he will be the first martyr uh, of the European concept of truth, which is uh, uh, so a self-lost, a heroic self-lost in objectivity. Uh, when objective truth is there, the subject has to disappear. That is a metaphysical foundation of, of science, uh, that the uh, researcher, the subject who is dying, the, the, the science, uh, has to be nullified with, reg with regard to the, to, the, to the fact. And when we are no longer able to, to die uh, uh, before, before, for, for, for the truth, there will be no truth anymore. And so uh, I think that the history of philosophy 
is uh, a long drama uh, that is turning around the question how can humans uh, perform this comedy of selflessness and how we modern we have re why have we reintroduced subjectivity in, in, into the drama of, of truth without completely corrupting the con concept of, of truth itself. Um, that is how, how I would uh, propose my, my introductory uh, remarks. Uh, what, it, what if God himself turns out to be our most persistent lie? What if I thought? If God turns God. out our most persistent liar. Okay. Time to reply. Sorry. <laughs> sure. mm -hmm. First, a brief introductory remark. When it was announced that we will be here together, many of my pseudo-leftist friends told me, how can you speak with this mm -hmm. neo-Nazi, whatever, uh, mm -hmm. he should be your enemy. And I gave them back a reversal of one well-known in English phrase. You know, when you have a friend who ruins everything for you, the usual way to reply is with friends like this who needs enemies. And my answer to those detractors is not mm -hmm. the usual humanist one. No, we are really, really friends. Mm -hmm. My answer is maybe we are enemies, but with enemies like this who needs friends. Yeah. That's how yeah. I see you. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, but uh, this is not the, f the first occasion to clarify our, our relationship. Our uh, strange friendship has also been expressed by you yourself in, in former days when you said after the revolution uh, you would make sure that I would go to the concentration camp as one of the first ones. <laughs> I but, but you would provide me with a position in the kitchen. No. Uh, uh, yeah. This is wrong. <laughs> Rumor. What I truly said is that you go to Gulag, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. But then I, in my central committee building in <laughs> Moscow, yeah. will make a special phone call there yeah. so that, you know, on Sunday in Gulag, you got a little bit better meal, like yeah. one <laughs> oh, uh, rotten uh, fish uh, uh, head. In, uh, one roast beef a week. No roast beef, no, just <laughs> rotten <laughs> fish. And I said, I will make a call there that mm. ah, you yeah. get two bowls of this soup every Sunday. Ah, sure. <laughs> that was all I get. Sorry, okay. let's go seriously. Now, to things, please. Uh, uh, I come to the conclusion which echoes, if I understood it correctly, what you uh, wanted to say now, the underlying insight that uh, uh, you know, it's not that we are spontaneously, naturally truthful, and then we are maybe cheated by some people, and so on, and so on. No. Most of us irreducibly pretend to live in sincere convictions which are mm. lies. And I don't believe in this. Some Marxists envisage it utopian moment when ordinary people will accept the full truth. So my first statement is, you all have heard about Abraham Lincoln's famous statement, which is not just a rhetorical trick, I think it's the ultimate uh, foundation, this presupposition of democracy. Without this axiom, democracy doesn't work. It is, you know it. You can cheat all the time some of the people, you can cheat some people all the time, <laughs> but all the people cannot be deceived all the time. I'm saying, yes, they can. <laughs> I think that the moment mm. when 
the majority, the crowd, however you call them, and I'm not here focusing on the poor people, with so-called mm -hmm. educated people, it can be very well. There are very rare moments when mm -hmm. they are ready to, to, uh, to uh, confront this. And I agree here with you, who already drew my attention to this, that it's not here a question of this traditional Marxist notion of ideological illusion when you are cheated. No, we in some sense even want to cheat ourselves. It's much more comfortable to live in certain type of sincere illusion. Now let's go a step further. What do I mean by this? Now comes my now, I am attacked all around the world as a neo-fascist authoritarian. I stop to care about this. But let me give you the first conclusion here. Spontaneously, we assume that people want to be free, and then uh, some outer oppression causes them not to be free and so on and to obey. To... No, I think that spontaneously, not in any organic biological sense, but in the sense of in our daily life, the way we are educated and so on, we are not free. And our time today is in this sense, here I go maybe a little bit further than you in my direction, that uh, 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 freedom hurts. To reach for freedom means to go against your, even if they are sincere, spontaneous intuitions and so on and so on, which is why, now comes the problematic part, I think there is no struggle for actual truth, or if we had liberation, without the figure of a master. Because what is for me the function of the master? Uh, uh, Herrschaft, almost in Hegel's scene. When we act spontaneously, we stupidly follow our daily interests. Some, the message of the master for me is not the Stalinist one. I know better than you what you want. No, the message of the master is you can to kick you out of this self-satisfaction, to step out of yourself, to take a risk. I will not go further into it, just to give you with what I think about illusion, even we didn't yet talk about it, my saddest recent experience. You see, this is the material power of uh, okay, in some sense, illusions, in some sense, understand them. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was at a round table at Birkbeck College. We debated South Africa. And there were there two old ladies, heroic, African National Congress, fought apartheid for years. And I couldn't resist asking them a simple question, which was, Listen, I'm reading in Western media all the time how South Africa is on the edge of collapse, becoming another Zimbabwe. Please tell me the other side of the story. And a dignified lady there, old ANC fighter, started almost to cry and said, let me tell you something horrible. The black majority, poor majority, the predominant Stance, Geistige, uh, spiritual stance among them is nostalgia for apartheid. You shouldn't say this mm -hmm. as a leftist. She told me, look, the standard of living of the poor majority was under apartheid the same as now, maybe even mm -hmm. slightly higher, but precisely because apartheid was an authoritarian state, there was certain basic safety and so mm -hmm. on and so on. Now is such a chaos and so on and so on. And so you see how difficult and obscene is to get rid of this fact by simply 
saying uh, they are manipulated and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Right, I don't know what it is. It's simply stupid to say this. Just one, two points that I mm -hmm. give you mm -hmm. back uh, the word. Would you go here, now I'm addressing you, even a step further in this direction of Wahrheit, truth, and say that today, maybe it's the time to turn around the 11th the thesis of Feuerbach. Mm -hmm. I think that what today we should say is, in the 20th century, we maybe have tried to change the world too fast, too much, mm -hmm. without understanding what we are doing. What we are doing. Now, the time has come not just to change the world, but we to understand it. Because I think we are more and more missing what mm -hmm. my Marxist friend, Frederick Jameson, calls mm -hmm. cognitive mapping. Even a vague idea of what is going on today. Just take China, China, People's Republic. What is this? Is this still the old communist mm -hmm. regime manipulating capitalist elements or what it is, it's a problem. Next thing, just to finish, I think it's very important. Here, I don't think we have a difference, but if you can clarify your stance, I will first clarify uh, my stance. Uh, here I take the lesson of psychoanalysis. I don't trust sincerity too much. There are a lot of lies or whatever, which we can believe mm. sincerely. And that's my big problem. I go immediately into hot waters of today's polemics. That's my problem with trans people. Yes, I give them all the rights, blah, blah, no. <laughs> but you know what's my problem? They talk as if the opposition is, on the one hand, it's biology, Mm -hmm. that uh, our sex is biologically determined, blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, it is, and I read so many uh, trans texts, it all amounts to this, arguments don't count, I feel like this. Mm -hmm. I feel that I'm a man mm -hmm. and a woman, and, or whatever. And my spontaneous answer to this is what you feel ah, up yours. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Feeling doesn't guarantee mm -hmm. anything. Here, trans people like to attack us. Oh, you are uh, 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 reading, you read Freud, Freud is uh, passé. No, Freud taught us something very important, that to come from bi biology to social, sexual identity, it's a complicated, traumatic social process which is very ambiguous. We often uh, 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 desire what we are not even aware that we want, and so on, and so on. So that would be, uh, that would be, uh, uh, that would be uh, one of my points mm -hmm. here, and the last one about sincerity, and so on. Mm. I'm here becoming, uh, as I presented myself to a German media, uh, they asked me, what are you? I said, moderately conservative communist, no? <laughs> and they at the Welt, they said, perfect, we are moderately communist conservative, so we can <laughs> collaborate. And yeah. you know what is my point here? Uh, 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 my point is that now it's something horrible that I will tell you. I'm sorry if I sound like right winger, but here I take very seriously what to say, with notion of the Wahrheit truth, I'm incidentally totally a platonic, mm. much more than for Aristotle and so on. But uh, I will immediately finish, sorry if I talk too much. Mm. What I, I wanted to say is that what is happening now in the West, we, I still believe that, yes, West did many horrible things and so on, and I know many things. It's not only African slavery, it's Latin America. Mm -hmm. It's maybe one of the most horrible things the uh, British and others attack on China, on China, opium war and so on. Mm -hmm. Horror. Yeah, yeah, but are we aware that even when critis we criticize this, 
we strictly remain speak within Western tradition. And we have, mm. isn't it time that we are not ashamed of this, that we, sorry to use this word, proudly assume it and say many things, and then I just say my last story, then I stop. Listen, slavery. <laughs> if I ask you slavery, <laughs> admit it, for 95% of you, the first reaction would have been, yeah, yeah, why it's kidnapping Africans. Sorry, but if you look at the history of slavery, first it was in all societies from Neolithic on. The moment you build houses, permanent settlements, it's nice to have a slave <laughs> to do it. <laughs> then, uh, listen, uh, first, there were no white people who went to Africa kidnapping their slaves. Are you aware that African, I don't know how to designate them, maybe not states in the Western way, already were highly de developed in the sense of slavery? Go to Ghana, Accra, Museum of Slavery, and they honestly admitted there White people, merchants, almost didn't put their feet on Africa. They were just parasitizing on and buying mm. surplus, not surplus value, surplus slaves from them. Point two, why only this focus? What about slaves by Arab countries from Eastern Africa? The number is practically the same, if not higher. So. What is, I will end with this ultra provocation, so what is unique about the West? I'm sorry to tell you this. It's the only, in the larger sense, civilization which, from late 18th century, systematically developed a movement to abolish slavery. No other civilization did this. Some Islamist friends told me, we did it. Ah, ah, ah. Read their text. <laughs> yes, slavery is permitted, mm -hmm. just you shouldn't have Muslim slaves. Mm -hmm. With others, it's not a problem. So I think that mm -hmm. more than ever, we should stop this absolute self-destruction of the West. Whenever somebody says freedom, there will be a politically correct pseudo-left. Yes, but freedom is a mask of exploitation, slavery. Mm -hmm. No, we should become, and that's the only thing we can give the world. We, Western Europe, modern United States. We should not be afraid to develop a certain mm -hmm. pride in our tradition. Sorry. Maybe we should send these people to Dubai so they can Who? have a look yeah. to Dubai. No, I will they can see slavery. Soup <laughs> in Gulag for him. Yeah. But that's <laughs> so uh, uh, short. Uh, yeah. Quite uh, short. My God, we short, are the boss. Uh, long, yeah. long answer. Yeah. <laughs> to so many questions. A short message from my virtual Gulag. Uh, <laughs> But if but, the gulag uh, with but, the human want, face. but the gulag is a good place to uh, uh, to talk about Plato once again because uh, for, uh, the essence of the Platonic turn of thought is that uh, he creates a profound divide between perception and reasoning, yeah. <laughs> and there is no truth in perception. And the, big, the biggest cheater of all cheaters, beyond personal interest, is the phenomenality of the world. So the phenomena are made uh, to feel us at home in the, in the world, you know, because we have become accustomed to that which appears and appearances show us and tell us that we are at home where we are. Uh, the Platonic turn introduces something very horrible because he demonstrates the asteroid, asteroidal quality of thinking, of reasoning, because he can uh, prove sometimes that perception is a deception. And uh, the ancient philosophy is nothing but a huge collection of examples of how perception is uh, uh, seduction, uh, uh, introducing error, uh, 
and uh, helping you to indulge with your eldest <coughs> illusions. So this divide between re reason, reasoning uh, and feeling has been carried on through the whole history of philosophy. When philosophy became criticized from the early 19th century on, in the post-Hegelian uh, position, the young Hegelians all had one argument. Uh, the philosophers have understood everything, but they have forgotten reality. They left out rea reality. They, they found a truth beyond the reality, but these, root, these truths are not rooted. And since from the 19th century on, philosophy is about uh, uh, a counter transcendence. Yeah, we have transcended too, much, too, too far and too much, and we want to re transcend, yeah, re descend into reality without abandoning the pretension of philosophizing. And that's, this, this is a point where everything becomes so critical. And if at the end of this movement, uh, a trans person uh, shows up saying, I feel like this, and my feeling is, is truth, we have reached the end of this retranscendence, because we have reached the, the point uh, from which philosophy originally started. That is, it, uh, it, it renounces to the immersion into the world of phen phenomenality. Uh, this renouncement is the creative act of philosophizing uh, as such. You prefer thinking uh, to, to, see, to seeing and hearing. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the, uh, the fate of philosophy uh, and the decadence, uh, decadence of philosophy began also al already with Aristotle yeah. when, 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 when he pretended that all men are uh, looking for truth by their own nature, which, yeah. is, which is absolutely untrue. Uh, whereas Heidegger is true when he says, wherever the man appears, wherever truth appears, humans run away. Humans run away when, when uh, tr truth is in the air. Yeah, why? Because truth has an unhuman and uh, sort of counter into a counterintuitive aspect. And, the, and this, the Platonic Revolution was announced by the Ionic philosopher Thales when he, when he uh, made this enormous uh, sentence that everything of the real cosmos is made out of water. There is no more, uh, stronger counterintuitive assertion possible. When the Pythagoreans, in their uh, small communi community in Cotrone, in, 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 in south of, it, uh, of Italy, pretended that the, the given world is nothing, but the truth is only to be found if you uh, are able to decipher the uh, mathematical partition of being, because everything is number. And what you see is, are, are numbers in disguise. They came from, from a musicological point of view because they di di divided the, the string of, uh, of ancient music instruments and uh, they uh, discovered the, the, the rules of intervals and they projected the, the numeric scheme of the uh, interval on, onto, onto the, the being as, as a whole. And we know today that the Pythagoreans were basically correct and that the counterintuitive approach to, to reality uh, is absolutely necessary in, in order to escape uh, this field of immersion in which our existence is caught. And this is one of the reasons why Heidegger is so interesting, because in, in his uh, uh, thinking uh, that is turning around the, the, the concept of Dasein, it seems to us that the last point of re-immersion into reality has been reached. At the same time, uh, his, his master Husserl 
tried to something similar when he introduced the term of Lebenswelt yeah, and tried to show that the, even the most abstract forms of, of thought are in, in a way rooted into something pre, in a, in a pre-philosophical reality. So the, the interest for the re-immersion of, of thinking in, in reality is, what is the main passion of, of great thinkers in the 20th century. Think about Merleau-Ponty, who was one of the heroes of this gesture, or, or Sartre, whose whole uh, idea turned around the concept of situation. Because situation is, is, is as it were, the, the French way to the Lebenswelt. Yeah? It is a Lebenswelt uh, charged by a drama. Yeah? The, the, the Sartrean um, situation uh, is, is Lebenswelt plus, uh, plus drama pl plus decision. Yeah? And, and plus tragedy, of, of, of course. Yeah? Whereas Huttel is the thinker, the probably the most distant, the most remote thinker when it comes to the question of the, the tragedy of, of human existence. Yeah. He has this godlike serenity uh, un, until the end. Yeah. And that is why uh, we have to consider this asteroid quality of, of truth seeking and truth making. Truth uh, is something that interrupts. Uh, con conventional, conventional forms of view. And in the modern cosmology uh, is nothing else but the biggest expression of this uh, terrible side of counter-intuition. Uh, because if matter does not really exist, but if matter, as the famous formula says, is uh, um, so, or is, is energy in, a, in another state? Yeah? So, and if energy is mass times uh, speed of light squared, yeah? you have reached the, the peak of something you cannot see, not feel, not hear. Yeah? You, have, you have once for all left the, spa the space of intuition and, per and perception and you have never to less to admit that, you were te that a truth is told when Einstein speaks. Yeah. And that is something that, that hurts that much. Uh, and the, the whole history of, uh, of, met of metaphysics has become dramatic because uh, the humanity as such is divided in those who uh, uh, will partake in the adventure of truth thinking, uh, in, uh, which means of not flying from truth, and, 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 and all the rest. You know? And this is split between, between, between monks and people, or, or, or as Gottfried Benn said, monks and criminals. <laughs> yeah. And this is the, the, the deep divide of, of humanity. There's, uh, just as Köstler divided humanities or the activist part of the humanity in, in yogi and commissars, so uh, Gottfried Benn divided humanity in, in, into monks and, 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 and criminals. And the criminals are, are those who are content with this self deception and the deception of others. Yeah, but fin finally, uh, we cannot decide who uh, who is who between uh, between us. Uh, there's an, uh, an old tradition that uh, there is one uh, crying philosopher, which is Heraclitus, that could be your role, <laughs> yes. and uh, a, philosoph uh, a, a, laugh a laughing f philosopher, which is Democritus. I'm for Democritus. Oh, but we yeah. both Sorry. Uh, we both cry. I th uh, yeah. I'm afraid we are, we are both. We pretend to laugh, but we cry both. Uh, no? <laughs> uh, I deeply... Sorry, did you... Mm. Think, uh, yeah, I think. I, uh, what you said now, it may appear just a rhetorical trick, no? Mm. This uh, cry, laugh, no? But there is a deep truth in it, in what sense? Uh, mm. I was attentive always, this is my old story, maybe you know it, to the fact that why are all relatively solid, not really good, but nonetheless films about Holocaust comedies. 
I think that when truth is too dramatic, mm -hmm. it's uh, fake. You translate it into our intuitions if you make an ordinary drama, like a prisoner in Auschwitz confronts uh, uh, the Nazi or in Gulag, uh, 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 kill me, I'm proud. No, when things are really horrible, mm. there is no place for so-called normal human dignity, only comedy works. And mm -hmm. you know, I will not take your time now, but I learned wonderful stories from my Polish Jewish friends. You know that already in 43, 44, there were in Poland Jews, jokes by Jews about Jews. It was the only way to survive. Mm -hmm. You remember 30 years ago, Srebrenica massacre. I will not bore you with them, <laughs> but they're <laughs> wonderful, I like them. I extremely brutal, vulgar jokes about Srebrenica. B but lo let mm -hmm. me not get lost. Let me go on with more important things. I find this, your counter-intuition stuff, uh, so important because first, now you answer yes or no, just if I got you correctly, then I go mm -hmm. on. Uh, uh, this is why, and would you follow me here, I totally opposed a certain, they like to call themselves anti-Descartes, anti-Cartesian trend, mm -hmm. when they say this split between feelings and uh, reason mm -hmm. is modern divide, we should unite mm -hmm. the two, and so on, and so on. No, this is too easy, and I will give you, sorry, don't lose time, an example, which I find very important on what to say. The worst ecological orientation today is to put it in terms our science, abstract approach, screwed it up, we should return to organic unity with nature. That's a fast road to total catastrophe. If anything, yes, science is responsible, but I like to quote here Wagner, the Wunde schließt der Sperr nur der Schluck. But without science, there is also, uh, there, is also uh, there is also no way out of it. And it's so important what you said, how this uh, counterintuition grows. Mm -hmm. Already with Galileo, it begins. I will not go into details, but then you have Einstein, mm -hmm. not to mention quantum physics now and so on. I mean, it's we are in a totally counterintuitive uh, uh, work. Uh, so just two concluding remarks. The first one, what I'm nonetheless tempted to do, and here I move a little bit, screw them if they will be bored, topic of more metaphysics. I deeply appreciate your big, thick work on sphere, spheres. But, uh, would you accept what I will say now, something relatively precise, that uh, this need for a sphere mm -hmm. in human sense, language and so on, appears only to a human being who is already out of its instinctual natural mm -hmm. sphere and exposed to wilderness. And following my beloved Hegel, I recently reread his, uh, you know, uh, uh, th third part of Encyclopedia, beginning Anthropology, where, my God, Hegel is more radical than Michel Foucault. He said at the beginning of being human, it's madness, self-destructive madness. Mm -hmm. And language civilization arouse, uh, you build a sphere to control your own madness. So I see subjectivity already, uh, already at this level. The last point, mm -hmm. uh, I will try to, and I wonder how you will react, what is in my nature. Now I will be a hypocrite. God created me like this, I'm an obscene guy, I cannot uh, uh, function without a dirty mm -hmm. joke. But I think this joke makes a point, maybe some of you know. It's a dirty one, but I'm not ashamed to tell it because it has a feminist twist, the <laughs> woman <laughs> wins. Uh, 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 wife is with her lover on the first floor in a bed, making love, and the wife tells her lover, don't be afraid, my husband is out drinking, he never 
comes home early, we have time. <laughs> Nonetheless, then, they hear some steps, a drunken husband is returning. The lover says, oh my God, should I jump through the window? No, no, says the wife, he will just fall asleep drunk, we can go on making love. And this is what <laughs> happens. But then, one hour afterwards, the husband nonetheless awakens a little bit, kicks the wife, who is between him and the lover, and says, my God, darling, am I so drunk or what? But usually when I look down our bed, I see four feet. Two of you, two, now I see six. <laughs> and then the <laughs> wife, feminist, good, says, listen, yes, you are drunk. Step out to the door and look again. <laughs> so he does it and says, yes, you are right, there are only four feet. <laughs> I think that what philosophy also can teach us is don't forget into what you see to include your own gaze, as it were. Always reflect on how you are included mm -hmm. into it. This has nothing to do with some subjective mm -hmm. relativization of truth and yeah. so on. What does it mean politically? For example, we now talk about, I will go directly into dirty politics. Dirty, dirty. We say Western liberal democracy is fighting new forms of oriental domination and so on and so on. No, this would be four feet. We are divided new forms of neo-authoritarianism and so on. Mm. There are six feet. You must include not only us as a united Western bloc, but the division here. Without our division, you cannot see it. Or just if I conclude with another, sorry, mm. similar example that I always use here for me, not subjectivity, it's still objective truth comes. Let's imagine I will take you so that I don't only on him. We are in 35 in Germany. You are not anti-Semitic liberal. I am a Nazi. <laughs> we debate Jews. And uh, the moment we reduce the debate onto an objective level, how are really the Jews? Are they like this or not? We are lost. The true question is not, were Jews really the way Nazis described them? Mm -hmm. There, the result is some cheap compromise, you know. Yeah, maybe they had a little bit too much influence, but Nazis... Uh, the true point is, why did the Nazis need a figure of a Jew to assert their identity? This reflexive turn is, for me, in, at everyday level, close to something maybe philosophical, this philosophical reflection. Mm -hmm. And now I speak too much. Hast du gelesen, wenn du jung war, uh, Winnetou, Karl May? Of course. Yeah. Yes. You know how, <laughs> after Winnetou ends, he says, Hauk, ich habe gesprochen. Hauk, ich habe gesprochen. Yeah. Yeah. Now I say, yeah. Hauk, ich habe gesprochen. <laughs> Bitte, du gehst weiter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he talked also to his horse. Uh, sorry? <laughs> what, what, I, uh, sorry I didn't, what? He talked to his horse. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you know who, no, you are yeah, here in no I'm way. Like uh, to, King to, Charles speaks with trees yeah, and horses. Yeah. So I would like to go back for just for a moment to, the, to that uh, concept of Im immersion. Yeah. Uh, because I, I think it has a, not only a technological meaning, the term as, as such stems from the, the field of uh, virtual reality. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. designers mm. and it describes this kind of uh, uh, optical devices you put in, in front of, yeah, your, yeah, of yeah. your own eyes and you look into a different world. Uh, but the reality of, uh, of, of immersion uh, is almost boundless because, because once you understand the principle of that uh, immersive or situationist thinking, you see, you, you see that everything is tinged by this question of immersion. How much are people in their situations on, and to, which, uh, to what extent they do not really belong to the situation uh, in, in which they are? And Heidegger has, has reached so, uh, uh, an, an, uh, the utmost limit of this uh, immersive quality of existence when he spoke about Dasein. 
Ja. In, in der Welt sein you also. Ja, but his, and his Dasein, this paradoxical uh, unit of ecstasy and situation. Ja. Das heißt, situatedness means to be included in a place. Uh, to share the quality of, of Dasein means to be, to be outside. To be, in a, to be in an ecstatic relationship with the situation. And the whole of the modern philosophical anthropology with, with Plessner and his uh, eccentric positionality of, of human beings and, and uh, the rest of, of all of them, they all have under, uh, understood that there is something exceptional uh, and rebellious about the human position. Max Scheler called uh, the, the human the Catilina of the cosmos. Yeah. So he's just not uh, a, a creature which is designed into, into, uh, to, to fit completely into a, his uh, environment. Because every environment is exactly that which, which what humans are leaving. Yeah. Yeah. And that leads back to the, to the question, to the difference uh, between natality and mortality. Uh, because life is something that is uh, in the middle of both. And the classical metaphysics were strongly oriented towards the, the finality of human life and they under, interpreted the end of life as death. But they always neglected the fact that uh, there is an original end at the beginning. And this original end is a, is a moment when the uh, ontological ecstasy begins. Because we are born uh, creatures and we, we, we are leaving a, a natural space that we are used to call mother. But in that case, it is a, uh, a wrong expression. We, we, we rather should call it matrix or something like this, uh, because uh, this is a, uh, a motherly situation we could call nature. And humans have the, the tendency to reproduce uh, inter, intra-uterine situ situations in the, in the outer world, especially when we are sleeping. Uh, because as we, uh, as, as, as sleepers, we uh, uh, we, s we stop this ecstatic, uh, ontologically ecstatic situ situation of, of our existence, uh, and we turn the the, the back to, to 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 reality and turn to towards uh, an, an inner 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 world that has maybe something to do with the outer one, but not necessarily. And, uh, but, uh, so my, my point is that uh, everything uh, drives us back to the, the question, uh, in which kind of situations do we really believe to be immersed? And, and we are surrounded to, uh, uh, by an exteriority which is highly structured by <coughs> counterintuitive truth. Uh, it is as, as if every truth uh, was, is, a, is a spaceship or a satellite turning around, around the Earth. Yeah? And we are, as, as, it, as it were, besieged by, by truth uh, that we do not really encounter. Can I make, if it's not too philosophical, a risk and then we can go to more popular mm -hmm. stuff? I, for a long time, wanted to ask you, because I'm sincerely not sure, am I an idiot here, did I get it right? Mm -hmm. For me, Heidegger is, I will explain how, I know his critique of the notion of transcendental approach, the mm -hmm. ultimate transcendental thinker, in what sense? For Heidegger, the ultimate, Ereignis event is a disclosure of being in a new 
way. Mm -hmm. Things appear not in a superficial sense, like mm -hmm. da Dasein means Sein appears to us in a new epochal, new way. Mm -hmm. But then, from time to time, I found this in the late 20s in his seminar on feared Grundbegriffe up to some late uh, book short dialogue with mm -hmm. Eugen Fink. Mm -hmm. He asks Heidegger this totally, totally naive question. But what happens with entities, things, independently of our perception of them? And then, very strangely, Heidegger engages in some almost theosophic speculations, which remind me even mm -hmm. of Walter Benjamin. At some point, he speculates that there is an infinite pain in nature, and that human language is a way for the pain, which is already in nature, independently of mm -hmm. us coming to work. So the problem with which I, with my, in my books, which nobody reads, am obsessed, is precisely this. Can we move beyond this Heideggerian horizon, which is different epochs of being, now only, our only hope is another disclosure of being, without, of course, returning to old, naive, materialist realism. Yes, we are part of nature and so on. I'm struggling with this. Do you have mm -hmm. something? Or yeah, but finally, uh, he strives back to a new form of immersion in the Parmenidean sphere. Yeah. He reintroduces in, in, in a kind of a pre-Socratic regression uh, uh, a state of meditation. Yeah. Because the, the human is, uh, according to the late Heidegger, uh, uh, is provoked to uh, abandon his, him, him, himself into a final meditation of his of his situatedness, so with in the in the innermost point of the sphere of Parmenides, yeah. that is very very, very strange. But it, it, it proves something uh, that he finally abandoned uh, his struggle with science, and he lost the struggle with science because he was no longer ready to 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 follow. The, the path of, of science into, into the depths and the abyss, abyssal, abysmal realities uh, of counter-intuition. In, yeah. uh, he wanted to, to uh, win back a situation in which uh, a, a simple being there uh, uh, on, your, on your walking way through the wood is, is enough. Uh, to reconcile you uh, with with being uh, as a whole, but uh, but but, where the, do but you the, the, here? The, 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 the critical moment is that uh, in 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 his interpretation of the history of the disclosure of, of being in technology, uh, um, he hears nothing but the, the bad news of technological power. And he does no longer want to hear that. So, yeah. But we have to de we have to deal with with these uh, with, with these powers in a, in, a, in a position of a as it were divided immersion. So, uh, uh, to stay in contact with without losing yourself to that. And this reminds me a little bit of this uh, as you are quoting the. The suffering uh, of, of of animals and the whole nature. That's what the Apostle Paul already said. Yeah? That the whole nature uh, is waiting for redemption. Yeah. In a, in a way. Yeah. But uh, but you yes, but humans please. could please. could only redeem the, the suffering uh, of the world by extinguishing every, everything. No. Especially yeah, some yeah. radical ecologists claim, especially extinguishing themselves. You know? Yeah, themselves, but they, but they would miss the mission to redeem uh, the unhappy animals as well, and unhappy plants. 
you know, where, where suffering begins. I totally be, I, agree with you here. You mm -hmm. know what is my polemics with those ecologists mm -hmm. who focus on humanity is a hubris. Mm -hmm. We ruin some kind of a natural mm -hmm. balance. My point is, sorry, are you crazy? Yeah. Uh, with our sources of energy, coal, oil, uh, can we even imagine what catastrophes must have happened on our Earth before humanity, for us to have sources of energy? But mm -hmm. can I now move a step further in my gulag with the human face mm -hmm. approach? You look already with the, five minutes. Five more minutes, and then, and we, then we, we open. Have, we, uh, yes. Sorry. Just then we I allow some terribly questions. would like to ask you, but I will bring them together, two mm -hmm. questions, as you, because it's important for our context here. At the beginning, you were right to emphasize the importance of Kritik der Zynischen Vernunft. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you are aware how important that book was here for the so-called, under quotation marks, dissident movement, at least mm -hmm parts of it, because the way you wonderfully there paraphrase, turn around Marx, not sie wissen nicht, was sie tun, aber sie tun es, mm -hmm. but sie wissen sehr gut, was sie tun und dennoch, yes, yeah. and nonetheless they are doing it. Uh, I remember that was my experience in the mid-late 80s. It was I had a friend at Central Committee of the Communist Party. He sincerely believed in ruling ideology. He lost his job. Uh, because to really believe in official ideology was already a first step towards becoming dissident. Mm. Cynical distance was included. And now I refer very briefly, don't be afraid, to uh, maybe some of them is here, to my, the other two members of Slovene, Lacanian Troika, Troika in the sense of KGB, three <laughs> liquidators, <laughs> Alenka Zupancic and Mladen Dolar, who developed this in a wonderful way, how, uh, how cynicism functions today. Mm -hmm. It's no longer simply this fetishist denial, je sais bien, mais quand même. I know how it is, but nonetheless. Mm -hmm. It is that the system reproduces itself through a permanent awareness of how it is. Like I think today the predominant talk mm -hmm. on ecology, mm -hmm. they say everything openly, but they say it in such a way that it, garant they, it guarantees that nothing will really be done. And I know this why, because this is zwangsneurotische <laughs> logic, and I am a model of that. When I was in with my analyst, I talked all the time. Why? Because I was afraid that if I shut up for a second, he may ask me a really difficult question. <laughs> so uh, uh, first, do you have anything to add, apropos today's situation and my last question here it's maybe deep 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 not so much polemic as a question in your wonderful book uh in english what happened in the 20th century you do something which i think is now becoming more and more actual when you say that we need not domestication of men but civilizing cultures. Today, mm -hmm. this is returning with a violence. Hegel is here the culprit. For him, at the, the mm -hmm. highest point of ethics of a citizen is war, to risk your life. Mm -hmm. And the whole ethical edifice, otherwise we are just particular being caught in our pleasures, mm -hmm. is that from time to time you are called to do this. Okay, now I yeah. ask you one thing that I already asked you. Yeah. I don't remember yeah. getting an answer. Mm -hmm. I quote you in English, again, the title just, from the domestication of men to the civilizing of culture. Of culture. Like, okay, yeah. who, how, where do you see even a minimal hope will do it today? 
I'm trying to impute you a secret communism here, yeah. as you can imagine. Yeah, you can, you can formulate a perspective of, of hope as soon as you, as you take a, a long, a long-term view of, of human ev evolution. And uh, in, in, the, in the long run, there is a, there is a chance that uh, uh, cultures will overcome the situation of mutual distrust and combat uh, and become uh, intertwined in such a way that the mutual domestication can go on. At the moment being, we are, uh, the, the open state of war has, has returned. Yeah. After the Second World War, there was a, a, a period of, of illusion because we believed that with the Cold War, we would, would assist the, the last uh, war and that we assist the, and we observe the virtualization of, of, of warfare. Yeah, the co mm -hmm. As long as it's cold, we, we know that uh, both parts of uh, possible warfare know that this war can no longer be won. Yeah. We have, uh, we observe today a regression yeah. into, into the ideology of, of victory. And as long as this, uh, the idea of victory is in the world, this is the, the real poison of world history. As long as the idea of, of, of victory is there, uh, we live in a Heraclitian world. As Heraclit said, the war or polemos yeah. is the father of all things. And he, and the, the second part of his, of his saying is more important. The result of war is the divide between God and man. Let us say between commanders and those who are to obey and masters and slaves. So the result of war it's a division between, between the free one and the, sla and the slaves. And uh, this is the essential re re result of world history as war history. You know? As long as war is there, as long uh, slavery uh, will, will, will exist. But in the, in the long run, I, I, could, I could imagine that the uh, progress of the process of uh, mutual uh, dependence uh, would uh, make uh, uh, set strong pro progressive steps uh, that uh, all this could, could could disappear. But let me comment on your on your on the first que question as well. Forty years after the publication of the critique of the reason, I understand my main error. Because when I made this uh, big chapter on the phenomenology of cynicism in the roaring 20s uh, of the 20th yeah. century, uh, I was sincerely believing that I was describing uh, a span of time uh, with a, uh, an amount of phenomena that could never return in the, in the, in the same way. And I was uh, sincerely uh, convinced that I was describing the peak of, of the cynic, cynical state of mind in the world. But this was an error be, be, because the, uh, the old distinction be, uh, that Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker had made in the 80s when he said the main problem, moral problem is of the West is cynicism and the main moral problem of the East is lie. Uh, um, he was right for his, for his own time, uh, but in the, in, in, the, in the meantime, the aufgeklärtes falsche Bewusstsein, the yeah, yeah, uh, enlightened yeah, yeah. false consciousness, has conquered uh, the whole of the of the of the, of the planet, and from Brasilia uh, to the United States to to Russia and and uh, many other parts of the world, uh, we see. Uh, uh, the emergence of thousand new 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 forms of of, of peaks of of, of cynical ma manifestations, and so uh, maybe we should uh, we should do a second edition of 
Lent kritisve. Yeah. <laughs> so can I, really, I will stop, but mm -hmm. one, my favorite maybe sentence from you. Uh, I would like to, I think it's also ultra actual. Whenever we talk about relationship, different cultures, blah, 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 today, it's always uh, <coughs> integration, understanding each other. But you said something uh, absolutely wonderful, I forget. You said more communication means at first, above all, the more conflict. You pointed out that what we need today, it's not this e e mm -hmm. eternal obsession with, mm -hmm. do, of course I don't understand you because I don't even understand myself and you don't understand yourself. We need to learn, I forgot the expression you used, keep at a distance. Mm -hmm. Why should this be bad? I hate this eternal pressure and here mm -hmm. for me, my concluding thought, I promise. Here <laughs> for me, uh, uh, the, uh, the formula of authentic multiculturalism, I hate even the word multiculturalism exists. Mm. I think that at some, the way it is used today, not this really integration, blah, blah, but I love examples when from a distance another culture can understand a culture, not in a racist way, but in a much more dialectical way, even better than that culture itself. I'm obsessed, for example, my eternal example, mm. uh, Shakespeare. I hate historicists who say, to understand Shakespeare, you have to know Elizabethan England. Mm. My first reaction is no, to understand Elizabethan England, read Shakespeare, you will understand more than reading here. But second point, you know, there are things in Shakespeare that obviously he himself didn't know what he said, what are the potentials. Mm. So I think we are, we as foreigners at coming later, what if we are in a <coughs> position to see dimensions which are in Shakespeare, we don't simply impute uh, or them on him, mm -hmm. which were in some sense there, but we can bring them out. I'm here referring to the well-known saying by Walter Benjamin that sometimes history is like you take a shot cinema, but the chemical to develop the film are invented only later. My saying is, for example, Shakespeare. Mm. The greatest m movie version of Shakespeare is, for me, Akira Kurosawa in 1962, Toshiro Mifune is Hamlet, returns from studies in the United mm. States, blah, 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 the usual story. I, uh, and it's uh, with a wonderful title, so mm. true. Only bad people can sleep well, because of course mm. they don't have <laughs> consciousness. And I love this, so uh, although I don't like too much with this, I will really conclude, Salman Rushdie. But at one round table with him, an idiot from the public attacked him in a politically correct way, claiming, but you are on Indian origins. Uh, you are now too much under British influence. And he gave a perfect answer. He said, no, it's not true. Two great Indian writers are the main influence on me. Jane Austen and Charles Dickens. He said, to understand <laughs> middle class in India today, is Jane Austen, these slightly impoverished families, how to marry your daughter, to understand poverty in India is the, you know, this paradox, this interconnection where you have to go out mm -hmm. to understand a culture, that's the only multiculturalism that I admit, absolutely not this obsession with we should integrate, understand mm -hmm. each other. Why? There are many people, even nations, that I fully respect, yeah. but I'm not interested in them. Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> ich habe gesprochen. Winnetou, zweiter Teil. Last reply? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Last reply? Okay. Ich sage nur eins, uh, I, would, I would add something more ele elemental to, to that observation. This is so-called post-colonial situation uh, uh, is con conditioned by the fact 
that uh, European cultures exported one of the most dangerous concepts that have ever been conceived on earth, the concept of the nation state. Yeah. Yeah, because the nation state is a, is a political form that asks for being filled by the ideology of a co co coherent population. The popula there is, but in the most cases, there is no coherent co uh, population. Take the example of Indonesia, for instance, a, a state created around nine, 1945 in the shadow of the Second, Second World War. A highly artificial cons construction consisting out of at least 300 different po po pe peoples and more than a thousand di di different languages. But the concept of uh, the nation state that was introduced he here and the Europeans were unable to, to call it back, yeah? as we do with, uh, with uh, broken down cars, where if something is, is not working, we'd call it, we, we call it back to the garage, but we cannot call back the, 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 the concept of the nation state. And so Suharto and his followers had uh, to fa fabricate a special national identity, a national, a national ideology, uh, which was brewed uh, uh, with elements of, so of socialism, mm -hmm. Hinduism, Hinduism and, and, and Western humanism, and which delivers today the the pretext for the most ter terrible prosecutions uh, of so-called uh, dissidents. So when I look out uh, into the world, uh, world horizon, I almost always see uh, the results of uh, the unfulfilled pro promises uh, of decolonization. Uh, because uh, the colonial powers always left uh, at the fault, at the wrong moment, either too early or too late. Um, and by the way, what, when it comes to the question of, of Indian identity, there were French and, and German uh, scholars uh, who gave back to the Indian their holy scriptures. Yeah, in the 19th century, there was Max Müller uh, who collected the, the, the writings of the Mahaparata and, and all the holy scriptures of, of the Indian. And this is the, the greatest gift a European scholar has ever made to a, to a dif different uh, culture. This is why the, uh, uh, English, uh, the, the, the German Goethe Institute in, in India are called Max the Müller Bhavan. Bhavan. Yeah. And, and that is a, a beautiful example for a, a productive uh, me meeting of cultures. But what I mean is that they should not come too close to each other. Yeah. 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 <laughs> then it gets dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now you have your task. Mm -hmm. yes. Get the institute should yeah. be slaughtered like mm -hmm. institute. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, we try to. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Slokerberg. Thank you so much, Mr. Zizek. I think we all had a great time and learned a lot again. I'm sure you can't wait to ask questions. Don't let them be too PC. Mm. Question. Here's a question. Yeah, you, you get a mic. No, because we will hear you, but probably the working class back there <laughs> will not hear you. Um, first of all, allow me to uh, give a, a very general comment. Um, apropos Lacan who says like, there's no sexual relation, it was nice to see you both sitting here talking and looking at, you, at you th each other, but there was no relation here. Like, um, uh, I felt like there were two languages that are spoken here, two different um, philosophical uh, mentalities or different ways of thinking. But it was nice also to hear you both speaking. My question is to you, Slavoj, when you were talking about um, pseudo-leftism or people who keep on talking about slavery or they are anti-slavery and they hold this very pseudo-leftist um, position. 
And I also I, I absolutely agree on what you said, and I'm be, I've been following what you what you what you've been writing recently. But my question is, how would you formulate a leftist, if I may use this stupid word, <clears throat> authentic leftist uh, position here? If I'm going to say no, I'm not. Uh, with this very naive uh, anti-slavery movement, for example, if I'm going to say, if I'm going to use this discourse, what's the radical um, um, position here? What's the radical discourse here? And I do understand you, since I am very a good reader, I may say, to Hegel and to Lacan, who's, who always talk about freedom from within the law, not from without the law. And I do understand what you said in relation to Hegel this way. But if I'm going to say, how would you talk about this topic, for example, racism, or um, how would you uh, formulate your position as a leftist, not as a right winger, since you're always attacked and uh, that you're fascist, that you're a right winger, how, how would you describe your position <laughs> in, uh, in right words, in, for example, in relation to this topic? Am I clear here, or? I think. I, I hope I'm so. Not sure yet. I mean, how, how do you describe it? How would you reply? What is your response to all those attacks who always say that you are, uh, I don't know, this and that? Uh, Question. Yeah. First, uh, I will say uh, that I absolutely reject the position that. If you criticize something, you must have a complete positive program, otherwise you shut up. I think we live in a horrible time of, I call them unholy alliances. For example, mm -hmm. let's forget about South Africa, but you know what a horrible phenomenon this is? I've written about it, but not here. I don't want to be published here in this, as President Trump would have put this shithole of a country. <laughs> so, you know, uh, do you know what happened in Uganda? Now it's already half a year ago. With big majority, their parliament voted the most severe law against homosexuality probably in the world. It's, if you are caught in homosexual act, mm -hmm. it's up to death penalty. Okay, so what? Ah, ah, you know, but I did something that many journalists who protested this didn't do. I went, because they speak also English there, to check on the web their newspapers. You know how they formulated it? All of it, as anti-colonial struggle. They said LGBT and all that, this mm -hmm. is the way. Western imperialism tries to undermine our societies. Either you are with us here or you are with the West. And incidentally, I don't want to lose time now for the, but this is what the game Putin is playing now. This is the idea of this new BRICS block. It means allow Saudi Arabia to do what it does, allow Taliban to do mm. what they do. The model of where we are moving for me are immediately after the victory of Taliban in Afghanistan, the deal they immediately made. Mm -hmm. It is. China said, we recognize you, who cares about women's rights, mm -hmm. but you leave us alone that we do in Uyghur with Muslims there what we want. That's, what, uh, that's where we are moving. So I just have this perplexion. As for what mm -hmm. you said, uh, 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 racism and so on. Now I will tell you something that may surprise you. I have, but it's not in the same way as this racist saying goes, you know, if you say some of my friends are Jews, this is the definition of anti-Semitism. <laughs> not friends, I have many collaborators about, uh, among the blacks. For example, a young guy who is very intelligent, Remy Adekoya. He wrote a book on cultural differences, not in a very deep sense, between Africa and Western Europe. He did something very simple. He made a large inquiry, which is politically the highest value for you. In Europe, it was equality. In Africa, it was wealth obtained illegally or legally. It doesn't matter. It's <coughs> 
incredible how we talk about inequality, how we treat Africans. Africans, they want wealth, survive, they don't care about, literally, about equality. <coughs> Here, <coughs> problems emerge. As for racism, feminism, sorry to repeat my old stories, but I got a lesson of a lifetime of this. When I was, some of you may know the story, some 15 years ago, Missoula, Montana, and met some Native Americans, so-called. Uh, you know what happened? They told me, don't call us Native Americans. This is for us the true white racism, because first, Native American, and what are you, cultural Americans, or what? Mm -hmm. And they gave me a wonderful, maybe you know it, jokish answer. They said, we much prefer to be called Indians, because in this way, at least our title is a, is a, is a symbol of white man's stupidity, who thought mm -hmm. <laughs> they were in India here. You know how often, that's what's the problem today with political correctness and so on, are they aware the extent to which their apparent criticism of racism and so on, and especially feminism, is secretly patronizing? For example, I spoke with Africans, I have friends there, friends, okay, we met in London, blah, blah, who told me that they are, that for them the most refined form of Western liberal racism is when there are big crimes in Africa, like Rwanda slaughter, immediately the Western left reaction was, this is just an effect of colonialism, no? And he said, F, three points, you, you don't even allow us to be bad. Even <laughs> when we are evil, it must be an effect. They are so sensitive, mm -hmm. or you know, there is another form of racism here. When some immigrants or whoever, and I'm open towards them, blah, blah, do something horrible, the, the, it's always, they are not guilty, it's how we treat them, they are conditioned. Yeah, but so are we. The implicit presupposition of this is that there are primitive people who are conditioned by circumstances, but we whites should be blamed because we are uh, uh, nonetheless in some sense free. You know, that's why I never trust this white people's self humiliation. We shouldn't assert our identity yeah. like if Indians dance their dance, there it's freedom. If you in a German village or me here dance a Slovene dance, it's neo-fascism or whatever. <laughs> you know what? Apparently I humiliate myself, but secretly I adopt the universal position. This my self-humiliation is false. And uh, uh, so uh, it's the same with uh, Me Too, with all that stuff. Do Me Too ideologists even know, do they talk with real women at their problem? You know where was for me the whole Me Too project wrong? Not from the beginning. There is an old uh, black lady whom I met, we love each other. I was obscene with her, she returned obscenity, we embraced. That's my form of love. But what I want to say, that she, she, I forgot her name, she invented even the term Me Too some 10, 15 years ago. And she told me she is horrified that because instead of confronting real women's actual problem, did you notice one mistake of Me Too, which immediately tells you about the class dimension? If you reduce it to principal examples, wasn't it always about typical dating scene? We met at a bar, yes or no, did he rape me? Sorry, what about millions of women? Who, uh, who, let's say, are in their mid-30s losing so-called, from our male chauvinist standard, sexual attraction, have two, three women, have no way out. Wh who talks about all these horrors and so on? In this sense, let me just conclude, I must go here. Uh, <laughs> this is my problem with cancel culture. This is a classical Hegelian case of falsity. Mm. At the level of content, they are all about 
uh, uh, inclusion and diversity. In their practice, the only thing they do is exclusion. And it's kind of a... I have friends there who admit this to me. It's almost a Stasi logic. Mm -hmm. You never know even what rules are when you will become suspicious. This is why, when I had a polemic with a right-winger in the United States, I told him, if I were a rich billionaire who wants to destroy the left, I would support cancel culture. Why? Because the way it works, it's permanent self-division, I suspect isn't what you said already anti-feminist, it was, it sabotages, blocks any possibility of a larger coalition of solidarity. This, these are my problems. And no, I'm sorry, I don't have a formula. I know that there will not be a new Central Committee. If you ask me, I will stop immediately, then you focus on see, him, this guy. <laughs> uh, 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 if you ask me, okay, but you are an idiot. Tell me one way where the left at least did its work relatively well. Well, I was engaged a couple of times, among others, you may not agree, I knew the situation very well. I'm friendly with the ex-vice president of Bolivia, Alvaro Garcia Linera, Bolivia. The left was there 12 years in power. The standard of ordinary people almost doubled, and they did it in such an intelligent way that they didn't scare the capital. That's why, you remember, two years ago, there was a coup d'etat, then new elections which Morales forces won again. So I'm totally opposed to Cuba, Chavez, Venezuela, Nicaragua. They screwed it up. In Bolivia, they didn't. So I see just particular hopes here and there. I'm very sorry. That's why I like to define myself as a war communist. Mm -hmm. I think we are approaching some kind of a new emergency states. And what Europe is doing now, the world even more, is, you know, treat it like, okay, let's change a little bit more, 5% here tax, eh? so just that our life goes on the way it does. We are still doing small things in order to do nothing. By war communism, brutal term that I use with all the irony, of course, I mean we have to prepare with hope that it will not happen, to more global cooperation, it will be necessary. Imagine a stronger pandemic. Imagine stronger ecological catastrophes and so on. We will have to collaborate, otherwise we will really enter new feudalism, what Janusz Varoufakis, with whom I otherwise often don't agree, predicts. I think, to conclude really, really, sorry, that uh, the problem today is not even any longer liberal capitalism or something else. Liberal capitalism is already gradually disintegrated. It is either something new or something where the world is moving spontaneously, which is much worse than capitalism that we knew. My God, the third Ich habe gesprochen, now ask yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it part of capitalism? Is what? That, what you just said, the, the, the thing that we're moving to, is it part of capitalism or is it something This is a different? big question of debate. I don't know enough to give an answer. Mm -hmm. no because time. some people like Varoufakis, Jody Dean, mm -hmm. think it's already a neo-feudalism. I don't know enough to pass a judgment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Spielt Kapitalismus. Spielt Kapitalismus. Yeah, but all these terms... You know what I hate in the left, I hope we agree. Whenever they see something they don't like, they call it fascism. Without any serious analysis, it's a simple word which uh, prevents you to think. Yeah, uh, they also called Nietzsche a fascist. <laughs> he, his claim was to be called a fool. Uh, and our uh, claim should be... Uh, to be, to be uh, insulted as much as possible. Absolutely agree with you, <laughs> yes. When somebody agrees with me, the wrong guy, then I'm in a panic. Once in the United States, somebody praised me and I started to sweat. What did I say wrong? <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry, please. Next question, please. Yes. Uh, uh, 
Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was just going to hone in on the relationship between philosophy and truth, as you both have uh, 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 sketched uh, it him, yeah. uh, tonight. Uh, there's another speaker for the festival, Catherine Malabu, who was here yesterday and the day before, who very, in a very similar Q&A, very explicitly said that philosophy and truth are totally separated. They don't, the, the relationship, uh, the interest of philosophy ought to be, in a kind of Deleuzean sense, distinction between sense and nonsense. Uh, I'd just like to hear your comments on not only that, but maybe just broader the idea of that the task of philosophy is to distinguish reason from madness, uh, health from disease, uh, space of reasons from the space of causes, uh, kind of a, a distinguishing act. Would you agree with that? Disagree? Uh, just curious to hear. Yeah, but uh, thinking begins with two gestures. Uh, the, the first gesture is to point to something, uh, but as the totality is something you cannot point to, you must believe that the act of speech refers to something. That's that the basic f function of language, to, to make you believe that meaning exists. And, uh, and if you d cannot believe uh, that meaning exists, uh, the language will, will die down and you will have the feeling that there is nothing to say. But if you have something to say, you will probably uh, in the beginning uh, pronounce distinctions. Because, uh, and you will see that binary distinction will help you to uh, get oriented into the openness uh, of the world. And the philosophical moment starts at the very moment if you understand that you have to go beyond uh, the self-made uh, dichotomies, the self-made uh, du dualities. Yeah? And the, the, the very moment when the, the third term come, comes into the, the, the game of thinking, um, all these, these distinctions uh, uh, become uh, remo remobilized uh, and, the, and the act of distinguishing itself uh, will be made conscious. And then you see yourself uh, make your distinctions. And as a distinction maker, uh, you, feel, you feel the free freedom to distinguish in a different way. That's what I, I, I could comment, comment on. Uh, on that, but I would uh, like to add something uh, to this uh, fascism question because uh, the, the air is full of uh, this kind of um, political in, in insulting. I would not uh, go into the detail how the term fascism was coined. Uh, according to my analysis, it was it was an invention. Uh, mm, that uh, was used by the uh, inventors of the Third International uh, shortly after the foundation of the Soviet Union. You must not forget that the Soviet Union was, was founded in, in December uh, 1922. Before Hitler's first putsch. Yeah, yeah, before the first putsch, but it was founded six weeks after Mussolini's uh, oh. r rise to power. And the people in, in Moscow did not know if this is a helpful thing or not. Yeah. And they uh, f had a, a long flirtation with the it, it, Italian revolution until they understood that Italy had delivered the pattern for what should happen in in Russia, that means uh, socialism in one country. Uh, and uh, Bukharin wrote uh, the, the, the textbook for, for, for Stalin, uh, and um, they did not really understand that the obsession with fascism uh, was so deep because they themselves imitated the, the Italian path. That means. To, uh, to create a dictatorship in one country with pseudo-revolutionary content. Yeah. Uh, one should know this when, when you use uh, th th these arguments. 
But for, as far as the philosophical approach to, to reality is concerned, since antiquity we have two types of martyrdom. The first one uh, um, clings to the, the pattern of Socrates. Uh, in Christian times, Jesus and Socrates uh, were parallelized very often because both of them were, were martyrs of truth. Uh, in spite of the fact that the truth of Socrates uh, was totally different from the Christ, Christian truth. And the Socratic truth, uh, in, in its own way, was uh, once more very different from the Platonic truth or the scientific truth, uh, which uh, is based on the elimination of su subjectivity. Whereas the Socratic truth, like, like the psychoanalytical truth, uh, insists on the fact that subjectivity must be taken into, into account. Uh, and these types of truths are uh, still struggling. And there is a, a type of very uh, toxic objectivism in classical Marxism, you know, because the, the, uh, as a metaphysics, as a Marxist metaphysics, uh, is a continuation of classical metaphysics from the point of view uh, that subjectivity has to disappear when confronted with, the, with, with truth or with, with facts or ob objectivity. And one of the, the key words of the Stalinist vocabulary in, in Europe in the, uh, from in the 30s and 40s and 50s and even 60s was objectively. Uh, Whenever something was called objective, uh, it was always implied that the bourgeois intellectual had to disappear. Yeah. And it was a gulag word. Uh, and I think this uh, verbal gulag makers uh, are, are still uh, at work. Uh, but finally, we could uh, make phone calls. Uh, in Moscow uh, and recommend us mutually uh, uh, for a double portion of food on Sundays. Right? Sorry. <laughs> can I, very brief, yeah. but I cannot restart. First, uh, uh, what you say about fascism is so deeply true. Do you know, for example, I read in a book, I forgot which one, a report mm. on the history of Stalinism, that mm. the pact, when there was a pact, in 39, was it 39, uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop, uh, no? Mm. And this collaboration. You know what Beria did? Beria, proto-Gorbachev, he first opened the Soviet Union in 50. Okay. He sent a special letter to all gulags, because, you know, there uh, guards shouted at you. Mm -hmm fascist, uh, uh, English spy, whatever, Trotskyite. He prohibited the word fascist so that Germans would not be mad. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. But another thing, ah, oh my God, now we, do you know this? Maybe I will nonetheless, you know, everything teach you, some, uh, let you know something. I now got two, three important books, not even writing books, about the link between early development of Chinese Communist Party and fascism. There was a meeting just before Sun Yat-sen, the founder of uh, Chinese Republic, blah, blah, modern China, met with young Mao Zedong, mm -hmm. and this was 24, 5, Italy, mm -hmm. blah, blah, happened, and their conclusion was that we need West, but not in the individual way, the only thing that we can take for the, from the West politically is fascism. Mm -hmm. We should learn to apply that kind of industrial development, but covered mm -hmm. by a strong uh, authority. I find this fascinating. And there is a whole school now, mm -hmm. not in China, they would be prohibited, who claim that that's what, in a soft way, Deng Xiaoping did. Mm -hmm. He turned China from a <laughs> communist country to a new version of fascist country. By this, I mean patriotic ideology plus industrialization and so on. Let's not lose time, but the second thing uh, that, uh, you know, Catherine Malabou, my God, we are old friends, I love her and so on, but I am not a Deleuzean. I don't believe in any 
big emancipatory potential of the left. Whenever people tell me, you Lacanians are potentially conservative, I just mention one book which I love. It should be obligatory reading for all the lesbians. Everybody knows it in Israel. A specialist of Mossad or who for inner security wrote a book, short book, how to fight a Palestinian terror, which is all Deleuze anti-Oedipus. He claims, you know when Deleuze uh, speaks about deterritorialization, different relations of space, mm. he, based on Deleuze, he elaborated the strategy of how, instead of the street from the side, you enter a Palestinian house, mm. when, and so on. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, it's absolutely not as self-evident as it may appear that Deleuze, in this sense, has some great emancipatory potential. I remain here with you mm. and with myself. Mm -hmm. You know, truth is not simply something objective there. Truth is, for a up to point Freudian like me, something very paradoxical. It's not the problem, this empiricist problem, it's out there, we never can reach the truth. No, the problem is we never can really escape the truth. That's the lesson of Freud. Even when you try to lie, the way you lie, you lie, the truth penetrates it. So no, I'm sorry, I, I, I totally reject the notion which is popular, that any reference to firm truth means the first step towards totalitarianism. No, mm. all great totalitarianists. If there was somebody who was in practice totally non-dogmatic, pragmatic, it was mm. Stalin. Everything depends on cir circumstances. Read Hitler, totally pragmatic, and so on. Sorry. Thank you very much. No keine I Frage, Fury. Yes, I think time's up, unfortunately. But who decides this? Mm -hmm. The boss. <laughs> Where is the boss? Yeah, yeah. Here's yeah. the boss. Gulag, you go to Gulag. <laughs> you don't even get a special <laughs> second place <laughs> on, on Sunday. Let's, but we are here. It's a, you, what happens if we stand uh, five minutes more? Yeah. My God. Yes? Okay. okay. Yeah. That, Please go out. That's what I call <laughs> a democratic yeah. dialogue. Really? Okay. No Stalinism. Yes, Stalinism. <laughs> Please, you have the guy here. The conclusion. Ah, Can you hear questions? me? So I have a question about your critique of certain forms of ecology, because a lot of Marxist ecologists would say that in this fossil fuel society in which we're living in, we're extracting resources to produce a form of, should I stand up? To produce a form of uh, surplus energy. So why would you say that previous forms of civilizations created or I guess, committed greater catastrophes than the one in which we're currently living. Oh my God, F3 points you. Ask him, not me, I'm all the time here. So I will be very <laughs> brief. Go to Google, Philosophical Salon. In a week, you get it for free. Mm. I have a long analysis of, of my good friend, a Japanese eco-Marxist, uh, Kohei Saito. Mm -hmm. who tries to argue for kind of a ecological self-limitation and so on. And uh, second thing, I didn't say much greater blah, blah, up and down. I just, I'm just saying, but you know how many nature was destroyed by humans even before modernity? Look, Iceland, I was there, they told me. When the stupid Vikings arrived there in 7th, 8th century, it was full of forests. In 30, 40 years, it was gone, building their stupid Viking boats or whatever. So don't, so many already previous civilizations, they ruined uh, so many things. I know today it's something more special and so on, but you know what? Uh, uh, disturbs me with these new eco-feminists. They think that it is possible to slow down to some more balanced development mm. and so on and so on. No, I think once we are in modernity, we cannot step out. Mm. It's lost. So. Can I go back to the Frage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. eco-socialismus, yeah. yeah.
I see a hand there on extreme right. <laughs> Uh, so my question is about freedom and dictatorships in the sense that I think freedom has these three elements in the way that one is having the information to make the act you want, the second is having the choice to make the act you want, and the third is to execute the act you want. And in a dictatorship we can see that the level of information between uh, individuals drops in the sense that there's less information and there's worse information, so everybody bec becomes more anxious about the future in the sense that they can't make the decisions they would want. And so my question is, given that information becomes scarce or basically unusable in a dictatorship, is the dictator free in his dictatorship? Yeah, the classical answer is that in, uh, in, in the tyrannical states, the tyrant is the only free person. Uh, but there is a second thought uh, to, to that statement. Uh, the uh, uh, philosophical irony wanted to demonstrate that the tyrant is uh, uh, 700 times more unhappy uh, than uh, an ordinary citizen. Yeah. Uh, so freedom can mean the highest degree of unhappiness if you are the one to have uh, to mishandle uh, all your um, compatriots. Yeah. But, but as you use uh, very often the, the term of in, in information, I, I think. Uh, that uh, in, in the classical situations of, uh, uh, of acting, the information principle uh, was reduced to the sign, to a sign that makes you act. There's in in Sueton is a, uh, the, 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 the Roman historiography. There's a nice episode when he uh, describes Caesar's hesitation when he is resting with his army on the northern side of the Rubicon. Mm -hmm. He does not really know what to do. And one day he took a decision uh, by interpreting a strange fact that on the other side of the river, a young, almost naked man, blonde, playing on a, on a flute was, was sitting and Jesus, Caesar jumped on the occasion and said, this is Dionysus who gave us a hint and now uh, let's go and to fulfill what's the unjustness of our enemies uh, and the rightness of, of God command to, to us. You know? And then he went beyond the, the the Rubicon. There's always a, a connection between the disinhibition of the act of act uh, of the acting, the passage à l'acte. Yeah? In in final analytical ter terms, there must always happen a moment when the discontinuity between motivation and project yeah, has yeah. has to be bridged, <laughs> and the bridging very often ha happens by the decision to take one part, uh, particle of this informational environment more seriously than others. Yeah. There's another nice example from the eighth song of the Aeneas, when, uh, when Aeneas is, uh, is sitting in, in fr front uh, uh, of an it it Italian city that has not yet been conquered. And he is also waiting for his own decision. And then happens something very strange, and that leads into the, uh, to the uh, peak expression of, of Roman imperialism. There happens uh, a lightning out of, out of a clear sky, a blitz aus heiterem Himmel. Aeneas' reaction is very clear. Let's do it 
what, what we have to do is that we, we, will, we will create this, that, that city of Alba, which will be the precursor uh, of, of Rome. And then he, he said what all these dictators and, and great men say, uh, ego poscor olympo, which means the Olymp is calling for me. So the gods are calling for me. Yeah. And so acting is always something that creates a, a relationship between a divine sphere or a sphere of truth and the low sphere of tendencies or inclinations. Yeah. And in order to transform an inclination into an act, you, uh, you need a uh, uh, kind of so, uh, um, hinge point um, as highly established uh, uh, as possible. That's why the, the term inf information is, is too, too weak to make clear uh, uh, what kind of energies are at stake uh, in decision making. Uh, would you agree with this beautiful haha, me again, temporal paradox? formulated by some very good action theorists. Yes, we decide for reasons, but retroactively our decision creates reasons. We are never in this neutral position, yeah. look, 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 this, re it's like falling yeah. in love. I like your hair, whatever, but that's why I fall in love with you. But only after I am in love, I see reasons. But to conclude, mm -hmm. not to drag time, to you, you know where I doubt what mm -hmm. you said? Listen, you called something democratic non totalitarian societies mm -hmm. where information is available and you can decide and enact. Do you think we live in such a society? Mm -hmm. We don't. Maybe no. even less than in some totalitarianisms mm -hmm. where people nonetheless, you cannot say it publicly, but they know the truth. In China, they know they are controlled. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are much less in illusion mm -hmm than us, or to repeat my old formula, the worst kind of unfreedom is the unfreedom which you experience as freedom. You are not even aware. Stop, stop, stop. Now we have... Yeah. Can I repeat my uralt joke? I read in my <laughs> book, on, I wrote in my analysis comparative that uh, when there is applause, a Stalinist leader always joins the applause because he's just an executor, it's applause, while a fascist leader never joins the applause. <laughs> <laughs> we draw this distinction here. Thank you. <laughs> I have to say this. I have to say this.